Good morning, everyone. And, and thank you to the Academy and to uh, Dr. Scott, Van Scott, and Dr. Frost for the honor of uh, sharing my research with you, my friends and colleagues. Um, I have some, uh, let's see if we get this to go, here we go, some disclosures. Uh, first of all, everything that's tumescent is off-label, so be warned. Uh, liposuction 101 is the clinical hands-on liposuction course that I give several times a year, and that the funds from that fund my research, and I do have an ownership interest in HK Surgical. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my lecture. I'm going to start off with the definitions of local anesthesia, tumescent lidocaine anesthesia, then give you some clinical photographs of what TLA can accomplish, I recount some of the early history of tumescent lidocaine anesthesia, explain some of the basis, basics of tumescent lidocaine uh, pharmacokinetics, and finally suggest some future applications. So, by definition, the standard concentration of tumescent lidocaine consists of a gram of lidocaine and a milligram of epinephrine and 100 milliliters of uh, local anesthetic 1% lidocaine, plus some sodium bicarbonate, 10 ml, and a liter of saline. And you put that all together and you end up with 0.09% lidocaine solution. And the definition of tumescent drug delivery is simply the inclusion of a drug within the TLA solution. And for example, we can deliver antibiotics subcutaneously or even a cyclovir, uh, tumescent acyclovir delivery, which we'll talk about soon. Um, so the following examples show why TLA has become the worldwide standard of care for liposuction. Under tumescent lidocaine anesthesia, surgeries can be done completely by local anesthesia, no sedation and, and no IV narcotics, etc. Quick recoveries. Uh, it allows for very significant hemostasis and vasoconstriction, which allows for the use of microcannulas, and microcannulas give us very smooth uh, results. The results uh, allow people to return to work in a day or two, very minimal post-operative discomfort, and uh, the results can also be uh, involve very delicate procedures. Uh, the results are typically very predictable, and even in older patients, we get a very nice skin retraction. So these are unique things for tumescent lidocaine anesthesia. Here's a patient who had a, a lumpectomy for a breast cancer in her left breast, and subsequently we did tumescent liposuction of her right breast. It resulted in basically a painless procedure with no scarring, and there's very few other procedures that can achieve this result. This is an example of how intense the vasoconstriction can be with this very dilute lidocaine and epinephrine. And on the right you see the aspirate, which on the bottom contains some blood-tinged infernate. That total uh, con content is uh, about 10 milliliters of whole blood. So we did this whole procedure and lost very little blood. Now in dermatologic surgery, tumescent lidocaine permits much larger office-based procedures and these are just the procedures that I do, but the other, patient, other outpatient procedures can be done. Uh, very large Mohs excisions, uh, large Mohs repairs, totally by local anesthesia, wide melanoma excisions, and uh, easily uh, done lipoma excisions. Now, the, the history of tumescent lidocaine is a bit of a meandering path. Uh, it started out when I was an internal medicine resident at UCLA. After that, I did a fellowship in clinical pharmacology at UCSF before my dermatology residency. And uh, my mentor there was Howard Maybach and Leslie Bennett. They gave me an opportunity to learn some pharmacokinetics. And pharmacokinetics is, is what interests me the most. This is simply the study of drug concentrations uh, in various parts of the body as a function of time. And when I finished 
my, dermatolog my, my dermatology residency, I had really no idea if, I, if or how I would ever use pharmacokinetics. And then Larry Field uh, suggested that I take a course in liposuction in 1985. I hardly knew what liposuction was, but when I did take the course at his suggestion, uh, we encountered a, a technique that was very, very bloody. There were a number of other dermatologists there. Some of them are listed here. And these are dermatologists that, who have been instrumental in introducing liposuction to our specialty. So at this meeting, uh, we encountered blood everywhere. It was, uh, the, it was not a discussion on, on aesthetics. It was a discussion on resuscitation. Patients got we're arguing about fresh frozen plasma or plasmonate or whole blood, blood, blood uh, products, etc. And this was obviously not something that dermatologists were interested in. And it occurred to me that, that one should be able to do this under local anesthesia with some very nice vasoconstriction, which would prevent all this. But uh, the anesthesiologist who I encountered there said, absolutely not. The maximum safe dosage was 50 milliliters or 500 milligrams per patient. And uh, then I got curious about that, it didn't seem right. And so I looked into it a bit and found out that the, the seven milligram per kilogram doses limitation is based on uh, 1948 studies on obstetric epidural anesthesia. And the FDA has, even to this day, has no data to support seven milligrams per kilogram for subcutaneous infiltration. So with that knowledge, I realized that there was no one who knew what the right doses was, so it was up to us to figure it out. And it just as a, as a research, little research project, I started out. And I wanted to know what the minimum effective concentration of lidocaine and what would be the maximum safe milligram per kilogram dosage. So here uh, was my very first case of liposuction. I, I wasn't going to rock the boat. I used exactly what was told. 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with epinephrine. It was for a little uh, collection of fat uh, above the abdominal uh, hysterectomy scar. We used 50 ml, and the anesthesia was excellent. There was no discomfort with the procedure, but in, while infiltrating it, there was uh, significant stinging discomfort. We had to go very slowly, and there was a result of a, a noticeable tachycardia because of the epinephrine absorption. So it occurred to me that if we had such good anesthesia, maybe we could dilute it a bit, get the same good anesthesia, but have fewer side effects. So that was the next step. We started diluting the solution, and yes, uh, that was the solution. Uh, we, with uh, 50 milliliters and 100 ml, the procedure got better. There's still some stinging discomfort and tachycardia, but it was less so, and uh, we had more volume. And every time I diluted it, Gradually, for, uh, over a number of patients, we found the anesthesia got better and better, and with less side effects and obviously much more volume, so we could do more and more of the procedure. It was pretty amazing to me that while this was happening. Um, eventually, I settled on about 700 milligrams of lidocaine in a liter bag, so my, my usual concentration is about 0.07% lidocaine for these big procedures. Now. And I started measuring blood levels because that's what pharmacokinetics do. Uh, and at that time in the 1980s, there were 20 articles in the literature that I could find that told us when the peak serum lidocaine concentrations would occur. And every one of them said it was less than two hours. So that's what I did. I measured lidocaine levels for up to two hours. and. Every time I did that, the lidocaine levels were negligible. And I reported this to my colleagues at meetings, and we all sort of scratched our heads and said, well, this must be to uh, the removal of the lidocaine by liposuction and because of rapid hepatic metabolism. So we as a group of docs uh, gradually started increasing the dosage that we would use, carefully monitoring patients for any side effects, and all the while taking blood levels. And, we went from 15 to 20, 25, 35 milligrams per kilogram, uh, and up to 60 milligrams per kilogram at one time was very common. 
but then one day I uh, asked a patient to allow me to get serum blood levels every hour for up to seven hours and when the results came back it was, I was uh, startled. It was obvious we had no idea when the peak lidocaine levels would occur and that meant we had no idea what the peak level was and that's particularly important because peak lidocaine concentrations are directly correlated with the risk of toxicity. So we needed to figure that out quickly. And I started measuring lidocaine levels in my patients over 36 hours. And with this, we were able to determine that 12 hours was the, like the most often, the most common time for a peak lidocaine level to occur. And I was able to correlate the peak serum lidocaine concentrations with a milligram per kilogram dosage and then use linear regression to predict what uh, dosage would be that would be s equivalent to about five micrograms per ml uh, of lidocaine in the serum. And uh, this uh, dosage limitation was published in 1990 in uh, Dermatologic Surgery and Oncology and that more or less established uh, tumescent liposuction as a safe procedure and it sort of ended the, the initial phase of the history of tumescent liposuction. Uh, but over the years, it became apparent to me and to all of my colleagues that there was something unusual going on, and that was that surgical site infections with liposuction are extremely rare, tumescent liposuction. It just almost doesn't exist. When it is done safely, with just simple tumescent liposuction and microcannulas. Once you add lasers and, and other things, there might be other tissue damages that might increase the risk, but certainly with uh, simple tumescent lidocaine, it was very safe. And also, venous thrombosis, uh, DVTs and PEs were extremely rare. And I've never encountered any of these in my practice. I had one small infection and, and that was it. So. I wondered with that uh, if that unusual lack of uh, surgical site infections could be extended and, and applied to other types of surgical procedures. For example, in colonic surgeries, the risk of surgical site infection is greater than 15%. So it occurred to me, why not add an antibiotic to this, such as cefazolin and metronidazole? So I set out to do a little clinical pharmacokinetic trial to, to observe what we might find. And uh, it's very interesting. This is all sort of new stuff that is definitely off label and I'm having difficulty getting the FDA to approve an IND to do a research, a clinical trial on this because it's so off label. Um, but you can see here, the red line shows the result of giving a gram of cefazole and IV and the serum concentration declines steadily. On the other hand, when a gram of cefazolin is put into tumescent lidocaine anesthesia and infiltrated subcutaneously, the subcutaneous concentrations remain high for hours, and this, to me, indicates that it would be an excellent way to prevent surgical site infections. And also interesting is the fact that as the, light, as the cefazolin is being absorbed from its subcutaneous reservoir, it it resembles a constant slow IV infusion of the drug, which is also has some utility in preventing surgical site infections. Another interesting observation is that when we mix two drugs together, cefazolin and metronidazole, which are compatible, uh, and gave them simultaneously IV, you can see that their concentration time profiles are definitely different. It's clear that, uh, that uh, the pharmacokinetics of these two drugs are different, but when they're given subcutaneously in the same tumescent anesthetic solution, their concentrations are uniformly uh, the same for hours and hours and hours, and this has some interesting implications for other drugs that we might use subcutaneously. Then the other interesting uh, observation was that DVTs and pulmonary emboli were extremely rare. To the best of my knowledge, uh, there have been no reports of pulmonary emboli in many of the, of the multiple surveys that I've read on uh, tumescent liposuction. On the other hand, in plastic and reconstructive surgery, there was a report of uh, 130 deaths in one survey. Amongst those deaths, uh, the leading cause of death was pulmonary embolism at 23%. So there's an interesting dichotomy. How could this be? 
And so my question was, is it that general anesthesia increases pulmonary emboli? By the way, the, the, those surgeons who responded to that survey all are surgeons who typically use general anesthesia and don't know anything about tumescent anesthesia. So does general anesthesia increase the risk of pulmonary emboli? Or does tumescent lidocaine anesthesia decrease the risk of pulmonary emboli, or both? So we started a little uh, uh, clinical study of this, but we knew, uh, we know that lidocaine does inhibit platelet activation at a concentration of one millimole. On the other hand, lidocaine in serum is toxic at 0.26 millimole. So most clinicians have just discounted the use of uh, lidocaine as a method to prevent DVTs and pulmonary emboli because you couldn't get clinical levels without first encountering toxicity. But from a, my perspective, tumescent lidocaine has a concentration of 3.2 millimole, which is well above the, the platelet inhibition concentration. So maybe it's possible that TLA has some effect on platelets. So this was another little clinical study that we did. We developed a test, an in vivo platelet function test, by using an iPhone app to measure the bleeding area. This is the area of blood that, it, that is accumulates on a disc of uh, bleeding time paper. And the sensitivity and specificity of bleeding area is much more sensitive, much better than uh, with bleeding time. So we used this and, and studied about 135 patients measuring their bleeding areas before tumescent anesthesia and then after tumescent liposuction. And it was indeed a very significant difference. And this indicates that tumescent lidocaine has a significant effect on inhibiting platelet function of some sort. And by the way, there were no changes in platelet counts. So that was not an explanation for this. The results of this clinical trial showed that TLA activates attenuates some aspect of platelet function, I'm not sure what, but at the same time, there does not impair surgical hemostasis. We still get excellent hemostasis. So it suggests the hypothesis that TLA possibly prevents DVTs and pulmonary emboli. So perhaps uh, tumescent antibiotic delivery with its lidocaine can have a double effect of preventing surgical site infections in general surgery and perhaps uh, decreasing the risk of PEs and, and DVTs. Now, there are, besides tumescent antibiotic delivery, there are a number of other procedures that are done with tumescent lidocaine these days. And these include vascular surgeries, mastectomies are done totally by local anesthesia, orthopedic hand surgery is now done with, uh, by that, sentinel lymph node biopsies, burn surgery, skin grafts are done with this technique. So, it, it was important to know what the maximum safe milligram per kilogram dosage would be uh, for lidocaine without a liposuction. And uh, we also know that uh, current estimates for the maximum safe milligram per kilogram dosage of lidocaine is perhaps uh, not safe. It's not, I'm not certain. It is, uh, possible, well, we know that lidocaine removes lidocaine and reduces lidocaine toxicity, but what if we gave the standard dosage now, which is 55 milligrams per kilogram, with the intention of doing liposuction, and then uh, for some reason, after that high dosage, we had to cancel the liposuction. For example, the patient develops nausea and vomiting or gets a migraine or the surgeon gets chest pain and the surgery is canceled. In that case, the patient might have a, a high, a high dosage of lidocaine, so we needed to reevaluate that as well. So we embarked on a clinical trial that uh, tried to answer these questions. And this is data from about 14 patients, these are just 12 of them. And we uh, recruited patients when they asked to have liposuction, and then we offered them the chance to participate in the trial, and if they did participate, they get liposuction for free. So the first two uh, events were infiltration of tumescent lidocaine and then measuring blood levels over 24 hours without any liposuction. And then the, finally we did, uh, the third episode was, uh, uh, was liposuction and measuring the lidocaine levels over hours. And we can compare the differences between the two with and without liposuction. And, it, and amongst the subset 
that received 45 milligrams per kilogram of lidocaine without and with liposuction, we could see the difference here. Here, the, the pink uh, areas show the average uh, concentration over time with liposuction, and the blue without liposuction. And it indicates that at least 28% of what we give a patient for liposuction is removed by liposuction. So it's clear that we could not use liposuction data to predict a safe dosage for a lot procedures that do not involve liposuction. And also, we noticed that there was a very, interest, very interesting uh, linear correlation, and we could use that to use tolerance interval analysis to estimate the safe dosages of tumescent lidocaine. Um, here with uh, no liposuction, you see at 28 milligrams per kilogram, we could estimate the Safe dose, the, sa the risk of exceeding six micrograms per ml, which is the toxic threshold for mild lidocaine toxicity, the risk is only one in five million at that dosage without liposuction. With liposuction at 45 milligrams per kilogram, the, the risk is one in 2,000. That's with liposuction. And if you look at the 55 milligrams per kilogram, you can see that my uh, data shows that uh, if we were to give 55 milligrams per kilogram and then suspend the liposuction, the risk of toxicity might be as high as one in four. So uh, I'm a little, a little uh, cautious about using that high dosage these days. So my conclusions were that 50, 45 milligrams per kilogram is a safe dosage with liposuction and 28 milligrams per kilogram without liposuction. And here's the Comparing the FDA-approved dosage and the TLA dosage, you can see that uh, with the TLA, with, with the FDA, we're allowed seven milligrams per kilogram. With uh, TLA, it's 28 milligrams. The volume under the FDA restrictions is 50 milligrams, and without any liposuction, the volume f is two th over two liters of fluid that can be used. So that really extends the type of surgeries that can be done. And in that respect, I regard the seven milligrams per kilogram approved by the FDA to be dangerous because it, uh, it, it means that anesthesiologists who regard uh, the FDA's uh, restrictions as gospel will not do local anesthesia. They will have their patients have general anesthesia when there is a procedure that can be done totally by local anesthesia, and I believe that's safer. So unnecessary exposure to general anesthesia is one of the consequences of that restriction for the FDA. And here, this is, an art, this is a, our data published in Anesthesia and Analgesia. It'll be published in May, and this is now available online that we review, reviews all of these results. Uh, so another drug that I'd thought about using is acyclovir. For years, we've been treating patients with tumescent lidocaine anesthesia for herpes zoster pain. It removes the pain instantaneously, just like, like that. You, feel, you do the, the seizure, infiltrate the local anesthetic, and they have uh, no pain for 12 to 18 hours, and uh, are very grateful for the fact that they can sleep for the first time in days. But it, no one has ever used or delivered acyclovir subcutaneously, and I thought that might be something worth in looking at. But there were serious uh, concerns were the, ca the compatibility and the safety of using subcutaneous acyclovir. Acyclovir, when it, it commercially, is one gram in, two, in 20 milliliters, and that is a pH of 11.4, and the, for 100 ml of lidocaine for one gram, it is the pH of 4.1. And when you mix these two together, they precipitate immediately. So they're not compatible. So here's a series of uh, dilutions we did. Uh, you can see on, the, on your left the two, do, two volumes mixed in a neat uh, solution. Then if we add uh, the two, two drugs to 100 ml, they precipitate immediately. To 250 ml, there's immediate precipitation. And if we add those two drugs to 500 ml of saline, uh, they precipitate overnight. But in a liter, there's no precipitation. And so that was uh, an interesting observation. And that occurred, well, maybe uh, we, we can do, do that. But 
tumescent acyclovir is definitely off-label. The package insert says subcutaneous injections must be avoided. So it's clear that no one would try this unless uh, they, they had an unusual perspective. Uh, but they did not mention anything about dilution of the drug. So I undertook to see what would happen with that one gram per liter of, of a solution. And I injected myself with uh, one-tenth of an ml of the solution uh, several times and, and no problem. And then over a series of days, I went, did one milliliter, then three milliliters, then 10 milliliters, and 30 milliliters. And there was no evidence of any toxicity. So eventually, I, uh, a patient came to me with zoster, and she was a physician. And I carefully explained to her the, the nature of what I was contemplating. And, uh, and she agreed to try this. And so we infiltrated her with tumescent anesthesia, which immediately eliminated the pain, allowed her to go back to work. and. Uh, and in fact, it more or less uh, arrested the progression of acyclovir. Now, she was also, my, these patients are also on oral uh, valcyclovir, but these are three patients that we did, and the results were very uh, encouraging, I should say. The pain was gone. Uh, they came back on a daily basis for a while to get more of this because the, the, it was uh, so comforting. Um, and. My impression with these three patients is that the, besides the immediate pain relief, it does seem to be safe. It seems that it reduces the intensity and duration of, of zoster. And I'm hopeful that perhaps we can use this to reduce the risk of post neurology, especially in patients who are immunosuppressed. So the next step is uh, applying for an IND to do a little clinical trial of this. Uh, so my conclusions is that tumescent lidocaine anesthesia provides excellent anesthesia for dermatologic surgery and great hemostasis. The maximum safe dosage, estimated maximum safe dosage, is 28 milligrams per kilogram without liposuction and 45 milligrams per kilogram with liposuction. And the tentative conclusion is that TAD may prevent surgical site infections and venous thromboembolism. And we hope that uh, tumescent infiltration of acyclovir may be helpful for herpes zoster. Uh, thank you for your attention, and thank you for the AD.